What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I'm your host, Truth Seeker. This is the Truth Seeker Podcast. Excited and delighted to be with you guys again today for this amazing episode, man. We're going to be talking about something really beautiful, something that is a, uh, a now word for, for a lot of us who are um, leading communities, especially online right now, which is where I am, uh, about dreaming like Jesus, getting his vision for ourselves, and tap it into the spirit. It's going to be good. Make sure you guys stick around. I want to give a shout out to everybody who has supported my work via Patreon, where our listener-funded show uh, doesn't exist without your help. So thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for all the support, everyone supporting on Patreon. Give a shout out to some of the latest patrons within the last week or so. Shout out to Reno, aka Ren. Thank you, my friend, for coming on. And Karen Lucas, thank you guys for believing in the work and coming on via Patreon. If you want to support and uh, get a bunch of cool perks, head on over to patreon.com backslash truth seeker. There you get access to my entire discography of music. You get access to our guided meditations, Thursday night uh, school of the mystics, which is uh, the community aspect to what we're building. And that's going to be tonight. It's going to be really good. So make sure you guys uh, check all that cool stuff out that we're bringing to the table. And uh, yep, it's going to be really good. Patreon.com backslash true seeker. If you haven't had a chance to check out my new book, it's here, Spirit Realm, Angels, Demons, Spirits, and the Sovereignty of God, forward by Jordan Maxwell. Check that out. It's available on Amazon, or you could just go to truthseeker.com and get a copy there as well. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and jump into today's discussion. My guest today is Rebecca Simon Peter. Rebecca, welcome to the Truth Seeker Podcast, my friend. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing awesome, and it's so great to be with the truth. another fellow truth seeker. It's terrific. That's it. That's yeah. it. Well, uh, yeah, we've had this uh, podcast book for a while, and now we finally got a chance to make it happen, and I'm excited uh, to see what you bring to the table. I got your book, Dream Like Jesus, and I've been able to go through it a little bit. I haven't been able to finish it, but I like what I've read so far. And um, there's some things that you bring to the table about some different problems that many churches uh, face and they fall into, I'd like to just kind of give it an overview of complacency in many areas, whether it's the area of prayer, the area of um, just being attentive to the needs of the people, being open and honest, but you address a lot of these things in the book. So if you just want to kind of give an overview about who you are, what you bring to the table, we'll start there. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because I wrote the book, of course, before the coronavirus, and the world has changed since then. Um, churches had a certain amount of inward focus and survivalism, and we got to just kind of, you know, keep going and make sure we're going to be okay. And even though there is a care and concern for people beyond the walls, they didn't really know how to get beyond the walls. Well, I, I like to think that the coronavirus has done for us what we could not do for ourselves. I mean, right now, people, you know, people used to say, hey, we've never done it that way before. We, we can't. And now people are saying whatever it takes, you know, pastor, to, to stay together. Yeah, we'll do Zoom. We'll do Skype. We'll do drive in communion. We'll do all that sort of stuff. And so one thing I should tell your listeners is that I work especially with church leaders. And uh, having been a pastor myself for many years, God shifted my call to um, being uh, uh, really moving from discipleship to apostleship, 
helping people move from being mere followers of Jesus to being active co-creators of miracles with Jesus. And so a lot of the work that I do as I train church leaders and coach and mentor is uh, help them expand their own sense of agency and have that ripple down into the churches so that churches are expanding their own sense of agency. Because, you know, over and over, Jesus said, hey, look, whatever you want, you know, come together in prayer, you'll have it. And, um, and of course, you know, whatever you've done unto me, you've done unto the least of these. So there's this sense of complacency is a good word. Um, Derek, there's this been a sense of complacency about, hey, we can't really do that much and we can't really, you know, impact our communities that much. And when you look in the scriptures, man, that is just not the case. The people that Jesus called, they were doing the stuff Jesus did. They were multiplying loaves and fishes. They were making miracles. They're out there doing all of that. And so my call has been to remind the church of who Jesus is, what we're called to, what we're capable of, and how you actually get there. That's awesome. We were talking about before we went live, you know, using Zoom and how, uh, like, everybody's trying to get on Zoom now. It's, it's, how, it's how we're doing life. But we've kind of been ahead of the curve. Like, you said you've been on it for a couple of years now. I've been on it for a couple of years using it. But now everybody's yeah. trying, to, trying to flock to it and figure it out. It's like, hey, here we are. We can teach you how to use it. We've been using it for a long time. And um, Exactly. In fact, in the groups that I lead, I have a program called Creating a Culture of Renewal that's being used in quite a few locations around the country. Uh, we've seen that our pastors that are in our groups, because we do a lot with Zoom, they've been so well able to pivot and do online worship, online communion, online giving, because they were ahead of the curve. And so there is something about staying tuned into the spirit, because you will get prompted. You will know what the next step is, you know, and and zoom right god yeah. whispered zoom in your ear and in my ear too <laughs> yeah i've been uh i've been using it again for years and uh creating a you know an, an, an online community we literally in our in our tribe we have people all over the world who are connected and with the Beautiful. power of the internet and, and zoom and those kind of things and so i want to know too just like how how does your book and some of these uh, principles translate over to an online community because churches yeah. are going there now so, the, I, is, I mean, do, do the same principles apply? I kind of feel like they do. I do, too, yeah. So the model that I introduce in the book, Dream Like Jesus, Deepen Your Faith and Bring the Impossible to Life, is the D.A.R.E. model. D-A-R-E. Dream. Dream the big dream. Uh, align people to the dream. Realize the dream. Bring it to life. And then watch the dream expand. So it doesn't say a darn thing about a building. You don't have to have a building for this. And I think that's what churches are seeing right now is, oh, my gosh, maybe we don't actually need a building. Um, so when you're dreaming the dream, let me start with that. So what is the dream? I talk about dreaming like Jesus, and I think Jesus' dream is found so beautifully in the Lord's Prayer. Thy yeah. kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and the way I envision that, Derek, is that... Um, all the goodness, all the love, all the light, all the justice, all the equity, forgiveness, love, humor, everything you think of as like ideal with God, that, 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 that somehow we would be expressions of that beauty, that wholeness, that those high values, that high vibration, we would be vehicles of that so that we're literally living the kingdom. It's not so much that it's a place or uh, it's more a state of mind, it's a, it's a consciousness, and out of that consciousness then we take new kinds of actions. So what I've seen the pastors that I mentor and coach and train, what they've done is way beyond what they thought they could do before, moving from that little inward focus to what does the community need? And what I'm writing about here is how does the church be the agent of the vision and the community or the kingdom, the beloved community, is the uh, recipient of the vision? So a lot of times, and you know, the kind of churches that I've pastored in and worked in and worked with, the sense is, uh, well, we have a church improvement plan. Like, we're going to be a better church. We're going to get more people here, and we're going to have better Sunday school. We're going to paint the bathrooms. We're going to get a better preacher. And I'm not saying those are bad things to do. It's just that's not really why Jesus lived and died and rose again. He, you know, in my understanding, it was for the fullness of our being and our potential to come to life and uh, to tap into that abundant life. So churches have more power, more agency, more ability than they thought they had. 
And I'm out to remind churches about that. I'm out to remind pastors that Jesus didn't call disciples. He called apostles. Their first step in their spiritual journey was to be a disciple, to absorb, to learn, you know. And then, But it was all for the purpose of being sent forth, being sent out. And he called apostles. So what does it look like to be, you know, in that apostolic mode and, and to, to be sent and to understand you're sent? But that's just part of what it is to follow Jesus is you're going to be sent. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And you, you think that's for everybody or just special people? I do. Nope. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think it's for everybody. And you know why? Because we're all special. And we all have this capacity within us. It, it takes a certain shift in consciousness and mindset. In fact, I'm doing a whole series right now called The 40 Days of Apostleship. My, my thing, Derek, is that if you're going to do the kinds of things Jesus did, and he said, greater things than this you're going to do, okay? And he didn't just say, just oh, just you and just you. It was a sort of a general you. Uh, in order to do the kinds of things that Jesus uh, said we would do, you actually have to not only believe in Jesus, but expand your faith so you're believing like Jesus. Not just having faith in Christ, but having the faith of Christ. Now that's that's a, just a slightly different word, but it's the world. It's a, such a shift in how you think about things. Yeah. And so, you know, what did Jesus believe? Well, he believed he was one with God. He believed his prayers had power. He believed he had superpowers. He believed in his potential. He believed in possibility. Um, those are the things that we're called to believe, I believe, as well. So that's yeah. what I'm teaching people is how to believe like Jesus so that you can actually be in that miracle-making mindset like he was. Yeah, for me, just the complexity of that lately has kind of been a little bit of a dichotomy because it's like, like, you know, we teach – you know, what Jesus did for us, you know, the propitiation for our sins and he became sin to win us in. A lot of people stop there. You know, this is like we just preach what, what he did. But then there's a there's people in the spiritual community, which I'm involved with. They they don't really teach that aspect. They teach do what he did. Let's love people. Yeah. Let's change the world. And and you got to do both. You know, I don't think and you can have one third, without though. the other. What's the yeah, third? But there's the third. So there's OK, what he did. And then do what he did, and then there's believe like he believed, to have the consciousness that mm -hmm. he had, to expand our inner being so that it's not just a physical expression, but there's an inner, an inner consciousness, there's an inner kingdom consciousness that allows us to, to literally do the kinds of things he did, not just feed the hungry, and that's excellent, but I'm talking about how do you multiply loaves and fishes, you know, how do you, how do you, be the kind of being that Jesus was, um, that radiates love, radiates healing, radiates. You got to have all three. You got to have all three, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. People, there's, a, and it's, it's been hard for for me to, to really articulate it because it's, because it just they seem so distant because we the church is really just kind of stuck on come to the cross come to the cross and okay that's it but it's like okay what do you do after you die at the cross and you're crucified with christ uh -huh. and like his story becomes your story you have to uh -huh. take up your cross daily and follow him you have to go out and do the greater works and stuff and so again you have a lot of people who stop there in the church and then those maybe outside the church they a lot of them are doing the other side better. Like they're like being Jesus to the world and mm -hmm. loving people unconditionally and like mm -hmm. doing all of these things and they're doing it better, but they have mm -hmm. no like uh, view of reconciliation and, and mm -hmm. Christ's atonement and things like that. So there's this mm -hmm. weird dichotomy that we're, we have to bridge there. At least what I found in my community, there's just one yeah. or the other and I'm trying to like, wait, Bring there's more, you know? Yeah. It's great, Derek. And then, you know, and you're right. Sometimes people stop at the cross and they, they stop at Good Friday. And it's like Sunday's coming. Come on, people. <laughs> resurrection, the resurrection power. <laughs> is the end of the story. Yeah. It's not the crucifixion. It's the resurrection. It's really the resurrection that keeps me coming back. Um, I, I know how to die. <laughs> I know how to, and I know how to self-sabotage and I know how to, you know, I know how to wind up dead. What I don't know how to do and what I need Jesus to teach me how to do is rise again. You know, and that's what we need. How do you rise again? And then how do you have the mindset where you actually realize, I'm going to rise from this. 
I'm not staying on the cross. I'm going to rise here. That's good. And I like to use the acronyms around fear. Do you know these? Um, fear, false evidence appearing real. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plea, or the other F word, everything and run. Mm -hmm. Or forgetting everything's all right and facing everything and rising. So the end of the whole fear story isn't death. It's not crucifixion. It's resurrection. That's what the world's waiting to see from folks like us. Resurrection. Resurrection power. That's it. Yeah, resurrection power, yeah. Um, I guess that's what makes Jesus a little bit different too, right? Because he, he not only was died, but he, he rose again. You know, he defeated Hello. death, you know. <laughs> Come on. And so and, that's what yeah. makes him different. Yeah, and over and you see it in the Gospels that he's walking on water, he's calming the wind and waves, he's multiplying loaves and fishes, he's rising from the dead. Every circumstance that we think is like, oh, okay, well, see, I can't get beyond this circumstance. Yeah. Every circumstance, Jesus shows, oh, no, here's how you rise above. No, no, this doesn't need to stop you. And so that's really what my message is about. The stuff that we think is, is our stops, walls, or they're actually doors. You can walk through them. Yeah. They don't need to stop you. Yeah, there's something there about, about you know, going to where the fear is or going to where the trauma is, going to where the, the hurt is and finding healing because we find out that that's where Jesus is. Like it's not, and here's the thing too, especially with everything going on right now, the Corona and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of people mocking the church. There's a lot of people mocking God. Oh, let's see you pray yourself out of this one. People are rebuking the coronavirus and nothing's happening. And like, okay, where's your God now? So there's, I think we have to understand it's like, it's not that we're not going to go through the storms. It's the fact that when we go through them, we're going to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. So it's not that we're exempt from turmoil. It's we're exempt from trials and testing or having to deal with fear. It's that we have a, a peace and, and our, our, our hope is eternal. Our hope isn't, you know, for today. Our, our hope is found in Christ. And so there's this thing there with fear. And so I've been I've been really, really big on that. There's just so many conspiracy theories and people who you would have never thought. I got pastors emailing me conspiracy theories. And what do you think? And I'm like, you know what? I think we need to quit listening to the outside voices and keen in on the voice of the Holy Spirit and see what he's saying. Forget what Trump's saying. Forget what who all these websites are saying. Let's see what the Holy Spirit is saying. So, again, dealing with that fear head on and, and not entertaining it. It's something we yeah. our, our mind likes to entertain the possibilities of what if, what if, and then we find all these fears coming in. And again, yeah. like you said, I go back to the first one you mentioned, false evidence appearing real. There's yeah. things that don't exist, but if you you give them life when you yeah. think about them, when you entertain them, and you'll, go, you'll mess right. up. Anxiety will set in, fear That's will right. set in, your health will start to mess up because you've been entertaining these scenarios that are not a threat at all. But, right. they, but, but it's to real to you in your realm, in your universe, in your world. It is an imminent threat and it's going to happen, but it is not on, the, on the forecast and, of things that's going on. And that brings to mind one other fear acronym, which is future events already ruined. You know, when we entertain fear, the, the whole future shot. There's just nothing, right? Future <laughs> events already ruined. It's over. Yeah. And then we give up and die, you know, not the good kind of death you know, of the, that brings resurrection. We just mm -hmm. give up. We just get resigned. I don't think that's Jesus's message for us at all. Not at all. I'm with you. Um, let's get back to the subject at hand with the book, because it's a really good yeah. book. And, uh, Thanks. and th th there were some things that, that you, you have here. There's eight symptoms. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I, w I want to address some of these symptoms that, that you saw, but yep. I want to get, I want to go a little bit before that. Like, how did you, see them like where were you spiritually like was it something that god ministered to you were you able just to see like this repetition going on in a lot of churches and you and you're like hey we got to address some of these things it's like an elephant in the room that we're not talking about what like yeah. how like how, how did you see the, these things operating in the church world absolutely well it's a little bit of backstory on me i'm born and raised jewish uh reformed judaism uh, loved it. I had Jewish mom, Catholic dad, and then I actually had a God experience that uh, brought me all the way to Orthodox Judaism. And so I was in the Orthodox Jewish community and, you know, deeply loving a lot of it. 
uh, when I had a Jesus experience, <laughs> which knocked my socks off, Derek. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't looking for it. Um, he came to me very Jewish looking, which is the only way it would have got my attention. Full, curly, dark beard, you know, wavy, thick, dark hair, olive skin, kind of a little bit short. And just the war and, uh, and the warmest smile, just the warmest, you know, crinkles around the eyes, like just love, radiating love to me and saying to me, hey, I understand you. I, I get you and I accept you. And I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't looking for Jesus. I wasn't any of this. And I was brand new in my recovery from addiction. So I'm recovering addict, alcoholic sugar binger, <laughs> you name it. I've used everything. And uh, and through that process of Jesus coming to me, when I wasn't expecting it, there was just so much love that came from him. And he didn't ask anything of me. There were no strings attached to this love and acceptance. But it got me curious. Like, I always thought, like, he and I were enemies, or he, I don't want anything to do with him. He doesn't want anything to do with me. He's not on my radar screen. And then all of a sudden, there he is. He's interjected himself in my life. So I went home, called up. Uh, I was at a, I was at a kind of a meditative place, and I called a friend of mine who was in seminary. She had one Jewish parent, one Christian parent, and I told her about what happened. And she said, well, you know, Jesus was a Jew. I was like, yeah, everybody knows that. She said, did you know the disciples were Jewish? I was like, hmm, what's a disciple? She said, you've never read the New Testament. I said, nope, it's not my book. She said, well, I'm going to get your copy. And I thought, well, I'm not reading it. And she did, and I didn't. But there was something about hanging out with her because she was in seminary. Okay, she was studying in, the, you know, for the ministry, just a PhD, actually. And I thought, well, if she's there. I'm going to go, you know, so I got, you know, Hebrew, Greek, and I'd already studied Hebrew for years, loved it, growing up Jewish, had my bat mitzvah, the whole deal. Um, I, so I wound up in seminary. I didn't think I was ever going to become a Christian, you know, let alone a minister. That was, that's not on my radar screen. And uh, just sitting in seminary, it happened step by step by step. And one day I invited Jesus into my heart and was like, it was over. You know, it was over. It's like, okay, I knew God was calling me to be with God's people. And you can interpret that all kinds of ways. There's God's Jewish people, God's Christian people. I knew this was a call to the Christian people. So I wound up in the local church. Now, the first church I wound up in, fabulous, African-American church, Scott. United Methodist Church in Denver, Colorado, and the spirit was alive. <laughs> I just went there to worship. I just went to worship. Yeah. Oh, my God, I loved it. And uh, I ended up joining that church. That was the first church I ever joined. And then, because I was in seminary, they uh, extended me the opportunity to be the associate pastor. Wow. A lot, of, a lot of steps in there, but I became the associate pastor. Absolutely loved these folks and the experience that I had there. And then I went from there to uh, the next church, uh, Denver, big kind of suburban church. And then I went to a church in Wyoming, which is where I am now. And uh, although I'm not pastoring anymore. So what I noticed in all these different churches was awesome people, fabulous people, well-intentioned people, loving people, and all these eight symptoms. <laughs> not equally in every single church, but some of the symptoms included shrinking numbers, Shrinking numbers in worship, Bible study, uh, Sunday school, even shrinking numbers in, uh, you know, people who are expressing their desire to be part of the faith. That was symptom number one. Symptom number two, problem people. Like, there were just relationships that weren't working. And when a church is in decline, and these are the symptoms of a church in decline, by the way. So when a church is in decline, when it's kind of like, oh, where the hell? and it doesn't have a vision anymore, then fights break out, you know, and, and in my world, it was a lot like kitchen fights, you know, <laughs> like, who's in charge of the kitchen, and should we let kids into the sanctuary, and, yeah. and so there was, there was a lot of conflict, yeah. and then the third symptom is stagnant giving, and that's where just giving goes down, because you're asking people to give to the budget, instead of giving to the vision, or mm. giving to the mission, or give to the community, yeah. and people just, they're just not as interested in giving to the budget, especially younger people. They want to change the world. Show me how to change the world. I'm happy to give what I've got. I'm happy to support you guys. But yeah. if this is just about keeping the building going, I'm not that interested, right? That's, 
That's the message. And then the fourth symptom is listless worship. And by listless, I mean like there's no energy, there's no focus. There, it, we're not going any place. We're just sort of gathering together, three hymns, you know, a, a sermon, uh, you know, greet your neighbor, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's not always inspiring. And again, this is why there's a church that's in decline, a church without a vision. The fifth symptom, gutless prayer. Can I just say that? Gutless prayer. <laughs> there's no guts. There's no glory. There's no asking the big things. And a lot of churches are saying, gosh, we wish we had more kids. But you don't hear those folks praying for the kinds of things that kids are concerned about and that young people are concerned about. And, and I hear in a lot of the churches that I've visited, the pastors that I've mentored, et cetera, there are three prayer concerns that are on auto repeat because they're kind of safe. So we're praying for the military, we're praying for our health, and we're praying for traveling mercies. You know, and, and honestly, there's nothing wrong with praying with any of that, but like, the kingdom, hello, is bigger than that, you know, and those prayer concerns. And we're called upon to pray with boldness, pray with guts, pray with chutzpah like Jesus did. You know, he prayed before he called Lazarus forth from the tomb. There's something about prayer, but, you know, when we're practicing gutless prayer, you know, you sort of get, yeah, kind of results. You, you know, you put it forth, you get it back. God's happy to answer those prayers, but they're bigger prayers, Yeah, I believe, that God would like to answer. Yeah, I've been and, I've been studying prayer a lot lately too, and there's okay. it's it's kind of a lost art for a lot of people it's because it's so art. just because it's so yeah. it om, it almost seems elementary, you know, like we've kind of graduated. But like going back to the simplicity of prayer, the simplicity of prayer in and of itself is very very. There's different types of prayers. There's different. I, I'll talk about there's there's hindered prayer, there's mm -hmm. uh, unhindered prayer, and there's things mm -hmm. that like. You know, there's uh, paths that your prayers travel when you, you know, there's things that block them. And so it gets really, really deep. And so we think it is something that, oh, I'm just, God knows my heart anyway, so I don't need to vocalize it. Like, no, you need right. to speak it out. You need to, to birth yeah. it. So, yeah, the gutless prayer is a big one. Yeah. I remember the time speaking of that. I was really depressed. I was in seminary. I was going through some stuff. I had some trials. And I was just depressed. And God was like, and I'm lying there thinking, why should I pray, pray? Because you already know what I need, need. You know, God's like, pray. <laughs> so I started to pray, and lo and behold, if my black cloud didn't just, whoop, and there was a part of me that was kind of pissed. You know, it's like, that shouldn't work that way. Like, I wanted to pull it back. And, and you know, that's not gutless prayer. That's just clueless prayer, what I was doing. <laughs> and sometimes our prayers are clueless because we don't actually, we pray, and then we don't allow the prayer to be answered. And that may be what you mean by hindered prayer. We don't allow the prayer to be answered. And that's a big part. And that's kind of another topic. But I like to teach people not only how to pray, but how to allow the prayer to be answered. Because sometimes we put up our own barriers like, well, I don't really deserve that, or I'm not good enough for yeah. that, or I yeah. couldn't handle that if it came to me. And then we just block it. So anyway, gutless prayer, I think, is one of the real symptoms. When we're talking about congregations that worship together, whether it's online or face-to-face, -face, it's house, church, small group, you know, big group, doesn't matter. We really got to get gutsier around prayer. And the only way really to do that is to have this big vision. And that's, that's the argument I'm making is we see all these symptoms because the churches don't have a vision. But bait-and-switch evangelism is one of the symptoms, too, and that's where uh, churches that are in decline and they're worried about surviving, they'll just say, hey, we got to get young people here. And so they try to get young people in. And what they're really trying to do is not share a message of hope, not exactly, not a message of hope and power and Jesus and all of that. But they want somebody to make sure that run the committees and take over the bills. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think that's dishonest. I do. I do. I think if you want people to come in and run the committees and pay the bills, you should say that. If you're inviting people in to have a message of hope, you should give that. Now, if you actually give a message of hope, you may actually have people want to stick around and run the committees and pay the bills. But it's not because they care. They love the building. It's because they've fallen in love with Jesus and who they get to be in Jesus. You know? That's good. Yeah. It's about being honest, you know, like I said, I mean, even with some of the giving and things you, you mentioned, like, you know, it's just, you don't have to lie to them. 
You have to trick them. Just be open and honest. Like if it is to to keep the building going, like there's a lot of small churches. Like that's the emphasis. Look, if you guys like the like the building, you like the lights, you like the AC. We need to help pay the bills. There's that, and then we have these other funds, the outreach and stuff. The big thing we've been addressing with the giving thing is like with the whole that 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 weird tithing, where it's like tithe. If you don't give it to us, then God's gonna take it from you. So there's mm-hmm. this weird giving with compulsion or mm-hmm. scaring you yeah. into giving, which is something yep. that's like turning a lot of people off uh, as well because they're finding out that that's not God's heart, you know, with that uh-uh. with that type of giving. Uh uh-uh. uh. You know, give with a cheerful heart, give abundantly, yeah. Yeah, so the what I've discovered around these eight symptoms is that they're it's pretty much across the board. When a church doesn't have a vision, you're going to see one or more, and there's a couple of more symptoms, insulated focus, it's just about us. And then the eight symptoms is dead-end decision-making, like nothing ever really gets decided. Because if it's too risky, we're going to put it on hold. We're only going to do the secure stuff. So what I've seen over and over is that this is what happens when a church doesn't have a vision, when they're not dreaming like Jesus, when they're not daring, when they don't have their focus on the community, but they've just got the focus on survival of the individuals or the building or the institution, that's yeah. when you're going to see those symptoms. And a lot of times, Derek, you probably find this in your world, um, we'll bring in the experts. Hey, let's get somebody to help us you know, deal with conflict, <laughs> or let's get somebody to help us deal with worship. And there's good people out there. Let's have a stewardship campaign. That's all good stuff. But none of that is going to create a sustainable shift in culture. And what this book is about and what my work is about is how do you shift the whole culture of the church from that inward sort of gutless, you know, to outward and bold and dreaming like Jesus. And uh, my program, Creating a Culture of Renewal, which is a three-year in-depth process for church leaders, uh, teaches emotional intelligence, teaches leadership smarts, teaches culture shifting, we teach apostleship. Uh, that's the process of dreaming like Jesus and bringing that vision to life in your congregation and in your community. That's awesome. Now, how do people make that their own and how do like, how do they embody it? What is there? Is there a certain prayer? Is it just reading the book? Like, how do they, like, once they have all the tools and things like that, how do they incorporate it? Yeah. Well, first off, it's important to do this, um, with some other people. Because to keep the dream alive, it can't just be here. You actually have to speak it out loud, share with other people, share the dream. That's the D. Then the alignment part is other people hear your dream and they think, that's cool. I'd like to be a part of that. Yeah, we should do that. And so you keep dreaming. You keep sharing the dream just like Jesus did. He went a lot of different places to preach the kingdom. And he got alignment in a lot of different places. You know, he had the 12. He had the 72. He had all kinds of people we don't even know about. And then together... You, you realize the dream. You bring it to life. But you got to have other people. Because my big thing, Derek, is that Jesus was, his ministry was apostolic. He invited other people. Those 12, those 72, they're the ones that carried out his vision. You think about it. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. him. He sent them on ahead. You guys go do it. So they went and did it. They went and did it. So to be, to be Jesus-like isn't just what he did for us or what we're going to do. It's how we do it. You get other people on board, you create a movement. And then out of that, that's where the ripple effects come. That's where that expansion happens and people's faith grow because they realize, oh my gosh, we just did something we don't even know. We didn't even know we could do. You know, we, we didn't think we could do this, but we did it. And how do we do it? We did it together. We did it with a Jesus-like dream. We took our focus off ourselves and we put it out on God's people. We put it out on the world. We put it out on the community. And so, and I've got worksheets in the workbook and you can go to my website, RebeccaSimonPeter.com and Rebecca's spelled biblically, R-E-B-E-K-A-H, Simon Peter, S-I-M-O-N-P-E-T-E-R.com. You'll see the worksheets there for the book. And uh, and then finally, a lot of people say, hey, I want to get involved in your your big three year program because I need more than a book. <laughs> you know, I need I need a community of people that I where I'm learning this with, and uh, I need to really get my church on board with it. So that's through the various options for people. I gotta ask you about the name. Thing, yeah, yeah. Ask me about lot, the name because the, there's a lot of people like even when I booked it, I told people, yeah, here's some of the upcoming guests, and uh, they were like. 
that has to be a a name that she took on. What, what's up with yeah. the Simon Peter? It has to be yeah. something, you know. What's yeah. so so? What's the deal with the name, Rebecca Simon okay, Peter? Is that you your real? Is that name. your real name? <laughs> so, um, it's not the name I was born with. And when I had this Jesus experience, um, I just wasn't the same human being anymore. And you know, biblically, there's all kinds of examples about how when there's this massive spiritual shift, the name gets changed. Mm-hmm. Jacob wrestles with the angel at the river Jabbok and becomes Israel, right? He wrestles with the divine. And it's interesting because my Hebrew name is Yaakova, mm-hmm. which is uh, basically the feminine form of Jacob, which she who wrestles with the divine, that's so me. But anyway, I told you about this friend that I called up and she's like, oh, you haven't read the New Testament? So she was in seminary. I went to seminary because uh, I thought, she's there. I'm going to go. I'm going to find out what this is all about. And while I was there, I got the call, I got the call to ministry, ordained ministry, but also I started to have this like whispering in my ear. I didn't even know, I mean, I knew who Rebecca was because she's Hebrew Bible, Old Testament. Simon Peter, I didn't know who it was. So I asked my friend, hey, um, is there a guy in the Bible named Simon Peter? She said, yeah, yeah. I said, is he a good guy or is he a bad guy (laughs) she said he's a pretty good guy so i began to read up because this was the name getting whispered to me so i began to read up on simon who became called peter and simon was a jew who followed jesus and in the process jesus changed his name to peter and i thought well that's why god must be whispering this name in my ear because i'm a jew following jesus and in the process I'm a changed human being. And so the name, so Rebecca was somebody who didn't go along with the way things were, right? The the eldest should receive everything. Um, But she had this, you know, business in her womb with the two kids. And, you know, she didn't, she didn't just go along to get along. She followed the promptings of God. And so that's Rebecca. And then Simon Peter got whispered to me. Um, And when it was time for me, I was at the, uh, I was at the uh, place where you go officially change your name, and there I was on the form. It asked for middle name, and I was like, "Oh shoot, <laughs> shoot! What do I do here?" And so, I it was long before you know Google and all that. I can't remember exactly how I came to it, but the name Ellen came to me, and I don't even recall what language that name comes from. But it has to do with light. So I thought, I want a name that has to do with light. So Rebecca Ellen. Simon Peter, and that's been my name for 30 years now. So it's my official name. It was a little odd, you know, going through a name change because people still calling you the old name. Sometimes my parents still call me the old name. That's okay. Mm-hmm. I answered all of it. Uh, and when I married my husband, Jerry Gonzalez, he's like, we're going to change your name. It's like, honey, I have changed my name so many times. I would love it if you call it, if you call me Mrs. Gonzalez, but this is the name. It's in the books. <laughs> Rebecca Simon Peter. Yeah. I heard that. I'm the same way. Like uh I go by Truth Seeker. That's what I that's my branded name. It's who that's I am. I, I grew yeah. into it after calling myself that. It resonated with me. Um yeah. and, and I do interviews and stuff as well and people try to book me as my regular name. I'm like, No, uh, that's I don't that's go by not that you. Name. Yeah, that's I that, did that. That's I apologize. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't realize. No, no, you could call. No, 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 I do that. On, that's like on a friend level, but as far as like you know, uh, ministry and podcasts and music yeah. and all that kind of stuff, it's it's just don't put it out. That don't do a video and put it up there. You can call me that all you want, but it's uh, cause I some, hear you. you know, some people have a, a hard time, you know, saying truth seeker or truth or whatever. They're like, what do I call you? And it's like, hey. You can call me Derek, but as far as like branding something or like introduce my, my, my work as right, this is, this is what it is. It's not branded under my regular name. So it was interesting. And, 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 you know, going back to, uh, to what you're saying about, you know, sharing that vision with other people, you know, the Bible talks about like, get the vision, write it down, make it plain so that those who hear it, the others, right. Find the others, the Mm -hmm. others can, who, who hear it can run with it. And they can mm-hmm. run with you and um, and being open and honest about it. And, um, you know, teamwork makes the dream work. And that's the Ooh, biggest like the biggest that. thing of like trying to, uh, you know, we we we, we tend to um, at least I found that we draw a lot of people who are like us. You know, mm-hmm. for me, it's like I got a whole bunch of podcasters. I got a whole bunch of ministers. We're all like we do the same thing. 
and um, and I, I like to kind of send them out right to kind of do their thing. But when you're building a team, a movement, like you say, you need to kind of find those people who are good at what you you suck at. Like exactly. I need so, like Jesus had a treasurer. Jesus had like other people keeping up with other stuff, you know. Uh, so he didn't have to deal with it. So when you're like moving with the vision, you're going to attract literally other people who are, who are like you. But it's like, right. hold on, I need to find the people who can who I can delegate work to. Mm -hmm. And Jesus mm -hmm. would even when he would send people like they would go to other other countries and, and, and nations and things like that uh, that he wasn't able to do. He wasn't able to go to because he was at in one place at one time. But through the Holy Spirit, you know, he's able to impact the whole world by being able to to send everyone out into the world so understanding that it's like this this teamwork and looking like almost like a business even like we need mm -hmm. to function as a unit together yeah. versus yeah. you know a bunch of heads or a bunch of you know hands on, in the body and they're, you're only doing this one thing and you're only good at this one thing the other stuff you're not skilled at but i think forming as a, a body of people who are growing together in community and unity and being sent you kind of need a little bit of everything that's so true in fact i've built a beautiful team um, of people that deliver the program creating a culture of renewal with me that teach workshops are people that have been through my three-year process that didn't want to leave and they wanted to be part of that community of people that that uplift uh, pastors and that train and that uh, help create, you know, space for God's biggest moments to happen in people's lives. They wanted to, they wanted to be trainers with me. So I've got a beautiful team of people and some of them do the same kind of stuff I do. Other people do stuff I just no good at, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. And I've got administration. I've got people that support the work because you, Jesus had a whole network. Yeah. He had a whole network of people and it wasn't just him and the 12. He had a whole other network of people supporting him and, and doing the deal, you know, putting the prayer list together and whatnot. People they could um, stay with when they traveled. Hey, we, we got exactly. people in this city. We're going to stay with them. The next city, we're going to stay exactly. with them. You yeah. Know, yeah. So I, I'm, that's, that's the whole thing about being like Jesus. It's not just what Jesus did. And it's not just what you do. And it's not even just the consciousness uh, of believing like Jesus. It's looking at how he structured things and structuring and deciding, okay, I'm going to be apostolic in the way I do things. It's not all on me. That's one of the things pastors fall into the trap of. Yeah. Ooh, I'm the pastor. I got to do it all. Jesus didn't do it all. You're going to kill yourself doing it all. Mm -hmm. He didn't do it all. He had people, you know, yeah. so being apostolic means you're empowering the people around you and together as a team, you're carrying this out. So when you ask, okay, you got the book, now what? You got the dream, now what? You got to get other people on board. Yeah. Because otherwise, it'll, the dream will bury you. you now, let me you, ask you, you about this people. because you, you've, you've been a pastor. You've overseen several churches. Um, I have, yeah. What about, here's the big one, when money, money comes in, mm -hmm. like you can't yeah. pay everybody. You got the pastor's like the only one who can get paid right now. I can't pay you. I need you to do it for free. I need you to do it for, out of devotion and adoration. God will reward you. You just, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So I think, you know, the whole thing of the, the pastor being the one man that controls it all, it, a lot of times it comes down to a paycheck. I can't, I can't pay a prophet to be on staff. I can't pay a, an apostle. I can't pay the deacons or whatever the case is. When money comes into play, it becomes a problem. That's why it's us for and no more kind of thing for a lot of people. What, well, what, what is the work around with that? All right. I'm going to tell you, when there's a lack of money, there's a lack of vision. I'm just going to say that when there's a lack of money, there's a lack of vision. And there's also a lack of ability to invite people to give and what you're asking people to give to. And it's too, it's too centralized. This is what I see now. I work primarily with United Methodists. And so we've got a whole system and a whole structure. Um, and, you know, there, there are pay scales and all of that. But I'm telling you, in these churches, which are highly structured and should be very, very functional and effective, when the money dries up, it's because the vision has dried up or because one person is trying to dominate other people. So if it's just four and no more, that's a problem. Jesus didn't do four and no more. So it's, it's, we look at money as the problem, but I want to say that money is a symptom of the problem. That's good. Okay. It's the symptom. And that's what I write about in the book with that stagnant giving. If you've got stagnant giving, it means you're not putting a vision forth. 
or you're not empowering people around you. It's just got to be all, it's all about me, or in some cases, it's all about the building, or it's all about survival. That's not Jesus' vision. It's not, and it wasn't even all about him for Barely him. Barely surviving. <laughs> yeah, it's not what it's about. So lack of vision is a symptom. Lack of giving, lack of money is a symptom of lack of vision yeah. or lack of delegation. Yeah, again, going back to the scripture, I think it ties into the other one about having the vision and writing it down. But the scripture says where there is no vision, the, the people, people perish. perish. You yeah. got you to gotta have a vision. That's right. And where there's no alignment to the vision, the visionary perishes because all the work's on their shoulders and there's nobody around to help you with it. Yeah. You know, and without without realizing the vision, hope perishes because that's that's when people say, well, we already tried that. That doesn't work around here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But yeah, that's, so that, that's how I see that is the lack of money is it's not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. Lack of leadership, lack of vision. Now, I've been able to. So with the online community, I, I think I have. Uh, I have two different like demographics, even with my community. It's whether it's okay. a, a Christian community or people who are, they're already Christians, they're already believers, and they have faith in Christ, but they're asking the bigger questions, but they're told not to talk about it at church. We don't discuss that. We don't believe that. Keep that to yourself, those kind of mm -hmm. things. And, and so now they've kind of found this uh, platform or creative expression for them to ask the bigger questions that they I think they have those questions for a reason right these desires they, they're looking into things that they're told to stay away from so there's I have a big portion of that people are already Christians and uh but they don't they don't feel like they fit into the regular church anymore so they're yeah. looking and so they find an online community like this and so there's th that aspect of people there's the other side of people who are uh into more the, the spiritual understandings and stuff like that and they're new to anything Christ Christian they don't have a relationship with Christ. They've never um, made, made that decision to follow Jesus. And so I bid them to come in, taste and see that the Lord is good. And so we have these two sides uh, coming in. Um, nice. With, with that being said, going back to the first one, there's just all of these people, uh, go, you know, going back to the first one that, that you even mentioned here, which is the shrinking numbers. Mm -hmm. These people who are leaving the church and like mm -hmm. record numbers. We got to do something. Something needs to change. Like if we don't answer their questions, if we don't fulfill the needs of the people, then they're going to go somewhere else where someone is. And a lot of times it's it's in the world. So, again, let's I want to touch on that one again. Uh, the first warning of a, a sign of a church in decline. What are some of the things that that we can do to address that? Is it kind of starting there and then just working through the other seven symptoms? Well, again, I don't think it's about working through the symptoms. I think the symptoms are the sign that the church isn't dreaming like Jesus. So that's what I see is that churches have shrunk their vision. And if it's just about the building, if it's just about the institution, if it's just about surviving, nobody is all that interested in that. That that doesn't quench the heart of the seeker. And you're, you know, you're a truth seeker and you've got people around you that want to know about truth. And um, there's all kinds of truth out there. Yeah. There's all kinds of questions, like you say, that people have. And I think one of the things you're doing beautifully and that ch churches need to do is engage in dialogue. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's <laughs> talk. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and I think that the kind of answers that we can have, there are biblical answers. And there are also answers that come from the Holy Spirit, that come from staying open being spiritually grounded, not in your head, but in your heart, you know, like what's going on in the world right now with this coronavirus? Many people I know when they tune into their hearts, the answer that they get is the earth needs to rebalance wow. itself. Yeah. The earth needs to rest. This isn't a plague from God. This isn't, you know, sin because of the gay people or women, you know, there's all this, like those oh, yeah. kinds of any, any theory you can think of is out there. I right don't now. believe that for a second. Yeah. No, the earth, the earth, you know, my heart says the earth needs a rest. And there are, there are all kinds of uh, ripple effects because we've overdone it, people. We have overdone it in many ways on the planet. So, but just, you know, engage in conversation and not having to be right. Can I just say that? Not yeah. having to be right. Like, maybe the answer is, 
I don't know, or I see it this way. I hear that you see it that way. Could we stay together in relationship? Uh, my denomination right now, the United Methodist Church, is having a big hoo-ha over um, how, how are we going to honor people or do we honor people uh, that are gay, transgender? Um, what, what's our stance on human sexuality? Yeah. And we got this side and we got that side. And we've been fighting over it you know, 50 years. And it's so interesting because the, there was going to be a big, big decision-making body that met in a couple of months. Well, coronavirus, we're not meeting. And the church is ready to split. So I just think it's so interesting because it may also be God's way of saying, cool your jets here for a minute. <laughs> you know? Don't be in such a rush to part ways or I don't know. I don't know what the Spirit's saying. But this whole idea of being in conversation, being in dialogue versus I'm right. Yeah. You're wrong. Oh yeah. That I've been there. Exist anywhere. I've been there. And the podcast has helped me to uh to listen to other people and not have to win the conversation or correct them when they say something that challenges my theology or what I believe or even if I believe it's heretical. We'll just have a yeah. dialogue. Let's just talk about it, man. You know, and I, yeah. I, I believe that he who started the the good work in us is faithful and just to complete it and mm -hmm. see it through. So nothing is like off the tables of just a conversation. And that's the one thing that I found in, in a lot of churches is like we can't talk about that stuff. If you do, we find out you are. Then, you know, we we got to we got to put a stop to it. And so. Uh, and that's really all I'm doing is having conversations with people, just listening. Doesn't mean that I agree or believe with them. And that's one thing we've been told in churches was like, they, if as long if you have a person on your platform or you talk to them, it means you uh, believe everything that they believe. Mm -hmm. If you quote a philosopher, it means you believe everything that philosopher ever did and stands for. It's like, no, I agree with that quote. I agree with what he's doing in this area. And so just being open and we we have to be more inclusive. And I think I think the church is moving uh, closer to that because those who aren't those who aren't are suffering from these symptoms and they're going to get left behind. They will. Yeah, it will take care of itself. So it'll take care. of It's growing I, yeah. pains, though. I mean, it's kind of a you know, it happens, <laughs> you know, it does. Yeah. So again, so here at the end of the interview, who is the book for? Is it just for church leaders or is it for those who want to dream? Yeah, such a great question. Um, it is for people who want to dream, especially people who see themselves as leaders uh, or want to step into that role of leader. It doesn't mean like official, you know, mm -hmm. like you're the one. Yeah. But you have that spirit of wanting to make something happen. You have that spirit of God's place to dream in your heart. You want to you want to dream bigger than you've ever dreamed before, and you, you want to know that it's possible, that it's doable. You want to make an impact on your community. You want to get some people together. You see a problem, you want to solve it. You know, you know from the scriptures or the spirit within you, there's more to faith than what you've been living. You know that God's calling you to something bigger. This book is your permission. This book says, go for it. Dream like Jesus. Deepen your faith. Bring the impossible to life. God's with you. The scriptures are behind you. You got this. Awesome. That's who the book is for. That's awesome. I think uh, I think you've addressed the elephant in the room. I think that you've talked about a lot of things that a lot of people see, but they're just scared to address. And that's when you know that, you know, it, it, it it's a need for it. Because once you start speaking about it, people's eyes start to light up. because they. right everyone's been feeling the same way, but nobody's articulated. Nobody's addressed it. So kudos to you for bringing us to the table and helping us uh, get to the next level as believers to, to live like Jesus, to believe like Jesus, to walk like Jesus and to, uh, you know, to believe in what he did for us as well. So thanks so much. Where's yeah. the best place for uh, people to go to get a copy of the book? Amazon.com is probably your best place. Or if you like to support your independent booksellers, um, you know, you can order it online. That's what I would recommend. And thank you. Thank you so much. It's so great to be with you today. Oh, I enjoyed it so much. Thanks for hanging out with me. I appreciate it. We'll have to do it again. Uh, yeah, be great. Thank you. Uh, all right, my friend. Many blessings. Okay. Thank you so much. It was really terrific to be with you. Thanks again. Okay. Right, bye. bye, bye. Rebecca Simon Peter, ladies and gentlemen. Leadership. Getting a vision. Dreaming again. Dreaming like, like Jesus. Daring to, dr to dream. To be able to dare, and and I really like that. I know we just kind of we kind of brushed over it, the dare. So we have all these symptoms and all of these things, and I think there's probably a lot more, but these do cover a lot. These symptoms that she has here about 
um, communities that are that are um, um, lacking. And it's not just about the com- community; it's about s- stuff that the individual is areas that they're 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 failing in uh, addressing that. But then, kind of like the model that she has to to receive that dream is the Dare model, which I'm gonna address these again because I really like it. Dare, D A R E. Dare, uh, D is dream to dream like Jesus to get a vision for people. Uh, to, 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 to believe in the, uh, the supernatural, to believe that God is able, you know, and, and, and just keep going. I mean, there's so much that you're able to get out of just seeing the vision that Jesus had, to be able to dream like Jesus. Uh, the A is for align, aligning others to your dream. Uh, you, I don't really have a mission statement as far as like what I do, but I think a lot of people will get it. I think just keep it, you know, several podcasts in, uh, one hang out with our community, jumping on our Discord. I think you kind of get the picture really quick, uh, aligning others to the vision and, and to the dream. So I think that uh, I don't think it's anything we have to trick anybody to. I think they're just being we don't have to convert them over to. We don't have to win them to our dream, our vision. I think being open and honest about it is organically you're going to find those people who are sticking around. So I've been, um, you know, when, when you're looking for people to help, when you're looking for people to put on, to, to delegate things to, a lot of times we want to just kind of like look for people out there who have like this soaring vision already. They're already running with the vision. They're like, man, if I can connect with this person and get them to delegate to the vision and help and let me see how I can help them, you know, vice versa. Um, for some reason, that's how our mind works. But it's like, hold on. I already have people in my circle. I already have people in my midst who are being faithful, who are showing up. They're already aligned with the vision. They're already aligned with the dream. Let me utilize them. Let me delegate some uh, authority to them, some responsibilities to them, and see where they can help. People are tired of being just another face in the crowd. When when the whole church thing turned off for me was when I went started going to church and they would give us these bulletins. You'd sit down with your family and you'd open it up and say, okay, they're going to do tithes and offerings. They got a guy talking about missions. He's going to talk about missions from Africa. There's two fast songs. There's the worship song. There's the message. And the message title is on, there's a theme. There's maybe a picture of the theme. And this is the message title. And so you just sit there and you watch like a play. You're a spectator. No, those days are long gone, my friend. People, uh, those who are seeking, those who have an active relationship with with God and and through Jesus and the Holy Spirit, like you're not a spectator. You're not just showing up to watch someone else do church. It's about a body of people coming together. The Bible says where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And so people know the power in that. We're not going to settle for second best. So for me, when it became something, I just became a spectator. I was like, no. This ain't lasting much longer. And it did. And I had to get up out of there. And that's just me. Everyone's different. But I then begin to become parts of fellowships that were more inclusive and more active. And do you have a word? I'll let you share it. What is God saying to you? Now, there are those uh, congregations as well. But just showing up and watching um, a service that you can watch sitting at home. There's n- nothing different. No, that's that's done. So aligning others to the dream utilizing people, letting them know that they're more than just another face in the, in, in the crowd. And God has a plan for them and a purpose for them. And uh, if they're around you, why not promote from, you know, the people who are already showing up? You don't have to go outside. You don't have to put out Facebook and, you know, Craigslist ads looking for people. You already got people right now. Um, the R, D-A-R for dare is realize the dream. You got to realize the dream and it, and uh, realizing the dream again, uh, where there is no vision, the people perish. So you got to have a vision. You got to have a goal, a mission statement. Again, I I really feel like a lot of times I'm a uh, sheep in wolf's clothing, right? I go into a lot of these territories where the church says, "Stay away, man. They're gonna get you. Be careful. You're gonna get possessed. Whatever." And it's just through a conversation with a witch. If you think you're gonna get possessed by having a conversation with a witch about their beliefs and their practices then uh, your Jesus is a very small Jesus. Um, but to realize the dream, realize what it is, the purpose. And I have a purpose. And uh, even though I have conversation, there is, I am um, 
mission minded with this podcast. It's not just to have a conversation. There's a mission to, to infiltrate an area, a demographic and a group of people who are unchurched, who have no idea our Christianese and our Christian rules and our Christian doctrines. They don't know anything about that. Uh, there's a, another aspect of those people, again, who are already in church, who are tired of doing church the same way. They're tired of, um, you know, being another face in the crowd. So it's realizing your vision. And then the E for dare, D-A-R-E, is expand the dream, uh, expanding it, uh, taking it out to the next levels, going bigger with it again. But I think that if you, I think that the expansion as well kind of plays into all of those other uh, uh, models because once you have them all in place, then I think organically as you're working them, your vision, your uh, territory, your borders are going to expand anyway. But uh, actively promoting, actively getting out there, actively shaking hands and kissing babies, if you will, but getting the message out there. And I think that the model that R Rebecca uh, has here is a very similar model to the model of, of Jesus and what he did. So, man, that organic relationship will, uh, will, will, will do all of that stuff. As long as you're staying in the spirit, as long as you're staying in the word, as long as you're in communion with the father, you're organically going to be doing a lot of these different things, I believe. So make sure that you're doing that. Listen to his voice again. Turn off the, all the other outside voices. They're here for to confuse you. They're here to scare you. <clears throat> They're here to get you to click on their their um, ads and clickbait and all that. So stay away from all of that stuff, man, and tune in, especially right now to the voice of the Holy Spirit. How do you do that? Open the Bible. Just begin to read. Ask the Father to reveal his heart to you. Father, what are you saying? And I guarantee you God has a now word for you that he'll speak to you through the Holy Scriptures. Get into it and get in with prayer, expectancy, expecting God to speak to you. And I guarantee you that all those outside voices, all those um, feelings and what ifs, they all begin to bow a knee to King Jesus. And it's very important right now. It's very important for me in my life because I've seen the power. I've seen the the darkness that's behind a lot of the stuff that's going on. And the only way that you're going to get through this, the only way that you're going to be able to maintain your peace while the world is in utter chaos, so the world is in utter confusion, is drawing close to God. James 4, 7, submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, resist the evil one, and he will flee. He has no choice. I'm submitted to God in every area of my life. Make sure that's the, what you're doing. Search me, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in me. Let that be your prayer. And I guarantee you that God will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast upon him. With that, I'm going to say peace and shalom. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Uh, if you want to support the work, you want to be a part of the, the ministry and what we're doing on Thursday nights, which is the School of the Mystics. We're doing it tonight. We're going to get into prayer, meditation. We're going to do some breath work, some breathing exercises that are really beautiful that we use the breath to communicate with the Holy Spirit, to communicate with God. If you want to look for a community of online people all over the world, no matter where you are, check out my Patreon. You get access to that for a dollar. You just get access to the emails and all that special stuff, a dollar a month. And there's so much more. Check it out, patreon.com backslash truthseeker. Thanks again for hanging out, guys. Many blessings to you. Peace, peace. Well, that does it for this episode, folks. To hear more episodes of the Truth Seeker podcast, head over to truthseeker.com. And if you're wanting to support the show and get rewards, go to our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash truthseeker.